Thessalonians, the Thessalonican church. This church is founded by Paul, not like Colossians, or the Colossian church, Colossi church, um, that he, as far as we know, never visited. This church was founded by Paul, um, I believe on the second missionary journey. In the first verse there it says, Paul, Silvanus, and Tim Timothy. Silvanus is just another way of saying Silas. So Silas was with Paul when he went. Uh, if you go to Acts chapter 17, and start there, actually, if you go to 16, uh, you see the kind of the history of the area and Paul getting to this place. Uh, starts off in, in Philippi, and that's where they're, uh, where Paul and Silas are in prison and, and in the nasty prison and chained up in a very uncomfortable position. And yet, in the middle of the night, they begin to sing. The Lord responds to that with great favor, rocks the whole place, chains fall off, and... The jailer's ready to kill himself because he thinks everybody's gonna is gone. And Paul, you know, cries out to him, lets him know we're all still here. Everybody's still here. Um, the jailer and his family get saved, but Paul is not allowed to stay there for very long. Uh, you know, he had obviously had been arrested. Not only had he been arrested, been beaten. Then they find out he's a Roman citizen. Now they just want him to leave quietly. Uh, he says, "No, bring the leadership here. They can come and let me out. They're the ones that put me here." Uh, anyhow, he gets run out of town there. He ends up in Thessalonica. He's only there for a few weeks. Gets run out of town out of Thessalonica. Goes to Berea. He's only there for a few weeks. Run out of town again. Goes to Athens. He's there for a little while. Has a great debate. Great sermon. Very little result. Run out of town. Ends up in Corinth. And ends up in prison in Corinth. And that's where Jesus appears to him because he is afraid. He tells the Corinthian church in their letter, I appeared to to you i came to you with a lot of fear and a lot of trepidation i was shaking in my he didn't have a great time he was having a bad year i mean that's not a bad day that's a bad year every this month after month you're you're you know your life is in danger uh people love you one minute the next minute they want to run you out of town on the rail it's not not fun not good until he gets to corinth and then jesus appears to him while he's in prison there speaks to him tells him everything's gonna be all right he ends up staying staying there for like three years so, this church, he was only there for a few weeks. He writes this letter probably from Corinth, only a few months after he's been there. Not a long time after he's been there. So, keep that in mind as we're reading through this, right? This is a church that was established in a matter of a couple of weeks. He gets run out of town. The leader is run out, the founder. And yet, this church is still thriving. You would think all these churches would just fall apart, you know? Paul comes in, you have a great thing, but then there's riots and there's all kinds of stuff. That wasn't just toward Paul. Other people were being arrested. Persecution followed him through these areas as he went through, either from the Judaizers or you would start to get it from the Romans. Because every time there's a riot, man, Rome didn't put it down with, you know, uh, tear gas and, and beanbag guns. They came in, it, it, was, it was peace by force. They came in and people died. You, know, you you put down, not with equal force, you put it down with much greater force, right? So, all right, what we're going to read about today and what I've been talking about, the persecution of the early church, it, it has not ever stopped. It's only gotten bigger. As the church has gone around the world, persecution has followed it all the way around the world, right? So, and, and it's coming here. I mean, it's ridiculous that we have to make laws that a man can't go into a woman's bathroom that's ridiculous you know and it's ridiculous that another governor will acquiesce and or, or uh, give in to the nfl and some other corporations and veto a bill like that that uh, the state senators and, and lawmakers had had made up and that happened in georgia you know, as soon as it looked like the governor was going to sign the nfl said oh well we'll just take atlanta out of the running for a super bowl I personally have watched my last Super Bowl for sure and probably my last NFL game. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. They got, they got no business promoting that. And, and what I like to, and some others have pointed out, is that uh, you know people like Bruce Springsteen and, and Brian Adams and PayPal and all these others can pull their businesses, cancel their concerts in North Carolina because they passed the law and because the governor said, our kids aren't for sale. And they pull their business and they pull, cancel their concerts. But you, you can prosecute a baker and you can prosecute a florist and make them lose their businesses and their livelihood and put their families in danger because of their conscience. So you see what kind of upside down world we have 
And to say that persecution com is coming to America is wrong. It's here. It may have a different form in most cases, but you know, you, you're seeing, I think, less and less coverages on mass shootings because it always comes out, not always, but most of the time comes out that there are targets for certain people. And, and it usually is the Christian groups that they're trying to call out and target. So it, it's, it's here. It's not coming, it's here. To the point that our local law enforcement here, I found out this week, have met with some of the pastors in the area and they've said their, their uh, advice is that once the church service starts, the doors are locked so that people can't just walk in because that's the time that they want to come into the churches. So they have people posted at the doors so anybody who comes in late can still get in, but if it's somebody that, you know, it just it puts up a defense at the, at the door for the church, a security defense. So uh, that's our local small town law enforcement recommendation which you know i'm thankful for they went and met with some of the pastors and put that out so uh you know that's getting ahead of the game that's better than a big town big city and don't say anything and let things happen you know so uh, just keep in mind uh, if you see some security type things maybe that happen around here it's not that we're afraid that god won't protect us it's that we're being smart and protecting the children and particularly the children and women in the church but everybody so uh, anyhow all of that to say guys this church only three weeks or three yeah only three weeks of having paul present with them and and this is considered an eschatological book in other words just talking about end time events both of these books three weeks he was there and three weeks he taught these people because when we get to those chapters and we get to those mentions and actually in all five chapters of this book he mentions the return of christ all five chapters so again there's a there's a lot of right now even in the church people say well why do you want to talk about prophecy all the time why do you want to talk about jesus coming back all the time blah blah blah. we've been doing this and and it's just consuming you this is a church that was only a few months old only three weeks in the in the with their main founder there and this is what he taught them and he's not teaching them in this book he's reminding them what he taught them in this book paul is already teaching the eminent return of jesus christ in his time so it wasn't anything there's not anything that has to happen prophetically before that can happen but the prophecy timetable is going to start going really fast once it does and now we can look back into other prophecies and find that in our day there's an awful lot happening that lines up with prophecy an awful lot now we're told nobody knows the day or the hour that the son of man will come that's true but we are responsible for knowing the season the timing of it we are responsible for that. Even Israel was held, we saw on Palm Sunday, they were held responsible for knowing the day of their visitation. That time they should have been looking for. That was a specific day. There was a timetable set for that. When Jesus came in on Palm Sunday on the donkey, and they didn't, I mean, it looked like they recognized, right? All the Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save now, save now, like he's the Messiah. And then he still goes out and he weeps for them because he knows. One, the leadership spoke the truth of the, of the condition of the country when they said, tell them to be quiet. For two, it really didn't mean anything because that mass mob was probably the majority of them the next couple of days later standing at his trial in front of Pilate saying, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas. But they should have known. And so Jesus goes out, he weeps over the town. He says, I would have, I would have covered you. I would have protected you if you would have just known this day, if you would have recognized it. But now not one stone left on another. And he prophesies about what's going to happen in 70 AD. There, there's not anything that I'm aware of that we have to point to in the Bible, in the prophecies that say that this has to happen before the rapture of the church. Not one thing. And we'll get into the rapture of the church. And yes, I, I am, Calvary Chapel is pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah, and we'll look at some of the verses for that. But my thing here now is that and i'm i'm not going to i never have but i'm not going to apologize for pointing to prophecy i'm not going to apologize for uh pointing to to in promoting that jesus could come at any second at any time in fact i think you find a warning in peter's writings that in this day they're going to say why do you keep talking about this you've been talking about judgment coming since the since our fathers since our forefathers and nothing's happened peter gives that warning that's one of the signs, and you're seeing it in the church. People want to get away from it. It's like this was some big money maker 
around the year 2000, and it, and it kind of was. You know, you had the whole Y2K thing and, and all that, and it was a big money maker, but it didn't change anything that somebody had took a doctrine from the Bible and abused it and misused it or whatever and made money off. It doesn't change the, the, the truth of that doctrine doesn't change the truth of that promise. And it's a promise. I'm coming to get you. We're going to look at that Friday uh, when we go through the Passover. Because Jesus told his disciples at that Passover, when he was establishing what we call communion, he told them, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you will be also. I'm coming back to get you. If we can't believe that, then what's the use of anything else that we say we believe? He died. He rose again three days later has to happen. Paul even thought about that too, right? If we don't believe in the resurrection, if it didn't happen, we are of all people most pathetic. He died, rose again three days later, 40 days later, the, or yeah, he ascends to the Father. He says, I'm coming back. So convinced of it, they just stood there looking. They didn't even, after they couldn't even see him, the disciples are standing there watching, still watching. An angel has to come say, hey, what are you doing? Why, why are you just standing here looking up? Come on, this same Jesus you just saw go, he'll come back, but get, get to work now. And they go to the upper room and they lock themselves in 120 people. And on the day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit comes and it starts. And you see the birth of the church. 3,000 people come to the Lord that first day. And every day people are added to their number. Every day. And then persecution comes and they flee and they run only to find their strength and their stability and to find their bravery in another town where they begin to preach and they begin to put the gospel out and it spreads throughout the whole world. And it's how it has always spread. That is the way it has spread the most, the fastest. And listen, I didn't want you to look at those two little girls that were answering that reporter just to break your heart, make you cry a little bit. It should be an inspiration to us. They didn't hesitate in their answer. What would you do to somebody who persecutes you? I do nothing. I'm just going to pray that God will forgive them. A little kid has got that. And too often we are set on revenge. We, we don't follow the examples of Jesus and Stephen as we're dying and saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We don't, we don't follow that on a daily basis. We're, we're here in America. We're asked to give up our lives every day as believers. That's everywhere. The, the rest of the church and the rest of the world where they live under persecution every day, that is a real thing to them. We have a hard time grasping it because it's not an everyday thing. It's not in our face all the time. You don't face the threat every day. You do more and more now, actually. I mean, doesn't it feel like we just woke up one day and now we face the threat of possibly being put to death every day? It, we have bombings. We have mass killings of all different kinds. It's not just guns. In our own nation. Some of them are our own homegrown terrorists. We, we have this. It's not to the same degree. Maybe as other places. Because our populations aren't as dense. Or because they're not as much. I don't know. Or maybe it's just because God is still protecting us to an extent. Because there's a remnant here who won't abandon Israel. And won't abandon God. But every day. Guys. Giving up our lives is more than dying physically. It's more than that. It is living in a way that promotes Jesus Christ and Him only and not ourselves. It's living that every day in our attitude and the things we say in the relation. We just finish that up in Colossians. It's every day. Every day you have to get up and decide to love somebody. Loving is not an emotion. It's full of emotion, but it is a way of life. It's a way of life. And every day you have to get up and decide to do that. Think about all that Paul had faced. We just kind of skimmed through Acts 17 and, and 16. And that's where, that's where you'll find him going through Thessalonica. And it's not much of a mention of Thessalonica. It was a, this place was a capital of Macedonian area. It's a Roman city. So the Roman citizens, if you're a citizen of Thessalonica, you're a Roman citizen. Population is about 200,000. Today, it's still there. It's a different name, and I can't remember what the name is now off the top of my head. But it's only 300,000, so it hasn't even grown that much in all these years. But it's still there. It was one of the first churches in Europe. It's considered a European community, part of the European area, part of Europe, anyhow. One of the first churches established in Europe. So let's just start 
get me off my soapbox here in a little bit. Paul, Silvanus, or Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the church is ecclesia, that's the name, that's, that's how you would say it in the, in the Greek. It's the called out ones. So whenever you say you're part of the church, you're part of the called out ones. You've been called out of this world. There's plenty of verses. If you've been in the church for any amount of time, you've heard them and you know them or you can find them. That say that we are called out by God. We've been called out of the dead world. Just like Lazarus was called out of the tomb and all the rest of the dead bodies stayed in there. You were called out of this dead world and you responded. Thessalonian, uh, to the Thessalonian church in, in uh, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, <clears throat> the order there, or the way that that's worded in the Greek, in the in the construction, Greek construction of that statement, God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ would tell us that Paul saw the Father and the Son co-equal. Right? So this is not the Father and the created or the first created, or however you want to look at him, like the Jehovah's Witness thinks he's the first created creature and then everything else was created after him and by him or whatever. Jesus is not a created being. He is part of the triune God. He is part of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are co-equal parts of the head of, the, of God. Right? Uh, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing that our, your work of faith, labor of love, and the patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, and your, uh, your election by God. For your, our gospel did not come uh, to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we, are, we were among you for our, your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with, joy of the Holy, or with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. All right. So we give thanks. We're going to talk about prayer again. Again, main theme, communicate with God. Just Paul constantly. We give thanks to uh, to God always for you or for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Right? And it's not like Paul necessarily every day prayed for the Thessalonican church. He would pray for the church in general, the whole church, all of the church. And and from time to time, and and you you guys you, you know what that's like, right? You're praying, Lord, strengthen the church, strengthen the body. Pray for your your our persecuted brothers and sisters on the other side of the world or wherever they're at. Every place they are. You know? we, we get real specific about the people who are in our face right now, in our in our hearing, under, in our understanding. We know. But it's not likely that, for me, when I pray for the persecuted church, it's not often that I, I would single out Iraq or I single out North Korea. I just pray for the, the church, period. And that's kind of what Paul is doing here. He's just letting them know, you're part of our prayers in that. we When we pray for the church, you're included in that. You know, we don't see you as a bunch of baby Christians that don't really know what you're doing. You just kind of wander around doing you know, or we're not, uh, we're, we're not, un, or we're, oh, I want to word this. Anyways, we're, we're, they're very certain of their conversion. They know they're their church. They know they're believers in Jesus. We can see through what we've already uh, read here. But, uh, so they're not thinking, well, we'll just give it some time and see how they do. They're included in the prayers. When I pray for the church in general, you're included in, in my prayers. I have, I have everybody in mind. When I pray for, for us to have re, be revived, when I pray for us to be able to reach out and to bring in, in, in work on bringing in a harvest and for God to work through us, I have all of us in mind. I'm just a few. Just the ones I think I can pick out and say, well, this one I know I can count on. This one I think I can count on. This one will go with me here. This one will go with me there. And that's who I pray for. I pray for everybody. I want everybody to be a part of whatever God's doing with us in, in, in the direction that he's taking the church. Everybody. You know, when I when I pray for strength, I, I may have one or two people specifically in mind, and, and I will pray for them specifically. But I pray for the strength of the, the whole church, all of you, me. And we do need to remember the churches. Listen, we've got a prayer list on the back that have the the five or six local Calvary chapels in our area. Get those and and and, and focus on them one day a week. We don't have to know all of their prayer lists from those churches to know how to pray for them. Pray for them. Just remember them. Lord, bless Kalamazoo. Lord, bless Battle Creek today. You know, we can do that. We can have a heart for everybody else, just like Paul had for the Thessalonians. Now, some people we saw, like Epaphras in, in Colossians, Paul said he labored for that church. That was the church that he came from. That was the church that he pastored. He labored for them. You know, I would hope, if this is your home church, that you labor for this church when you pray. 
And it is more than just an in general pray for the church. I would hope that you do that. And listen, we need to, not just because of persecution, we need to really be praying for the church because it's, it's not in good shape right now in America. It really isn't. I haven't seen what they project for this year, but the projection for 2015, and I don't know what the totals were, but the projection for 2015 were for 3,000, 3,500 to 4,000 churches to shut down last year. It's an estimated 1,500 pastors leave the ministry for whatever reason every month in America. 1,500 pastors every month leave the ministry for one reason or another. People are going to seminaries, and instead of coming out on fire ready to face the world and take on the world and ready to preach the gospel, they're getting disillusioned in their seminaries, and they don't even go into the ministry. We need to pray for the churches. And I told you guys at the beginning of the year, and I've tried to maintain that through the rest of this year so far, but the prayer is important for us. This is, a, this is something that we need in our church, in our little body. We need to be praying for the direction that God has us to go. And I'm telling you guys, I shared a little bit last week that I think there's a big outreach possible to start here anyways if it's not because we all go out in this state. And we have a lot to face in our own state. Our, our lawmakers now are, are going over trying to make bills or trying to make laws or trying to decide if they're going to make laws about the bathroom laws and all that. Right now they're considering all the same thing. Don't think they haven't watched Georgia and North Carolina. Do you know what? Georgia didn't get a lot of cheerleaders when their, when their governor vetoed their law. And North Carolina has got a tremendous swell of support from all over the country because they stood up to this. We're in a state that is trying to recover economically in a big way. Don't think that the temptation for our leaders won't be to cave in. And now we've had this fiasco in Flint. Don't think that our governor won't be tempted to cave in to pressure. We need to pray for them. Pray that they're going to have the backbone to stand up to all this baloney out there and make the right choices and the right decisions to protect our children and to protect our women and to protect us in general, period. The law in Georgia that was vetoed by that governor would have protected the churches from having to allow same-sex marriages and having to force their pastors into uh, performing those ceremonies. It would have protected the pastors in the churches and he vetoed it because of the NFL. I'm sure it would bring a court case for the first pastor that, that turns it down. It'll go to court just like any place else. And they'll do it. Right now the churches, I, right now the churches, as far as I know, anywhere by federal law are protected. Should be. But who knows? Because our Supreme Court won't back anything up, you know? And our president's not going to back anything up, and most of our lawmakers won't. Right? And to be honest with you, the, the political atmosphere in this part of our state is not the same in the rest of the state. Detroit is complete opposite of the, of the west side of the state. They're very liberal, very all of it. So we, we have a lot of praying to do. We need to be calling and, and, and writing emails or whatever to our senators and our representatives, encouraging them, letting them know that we're praying for them, letting them know that, that we're behind them, that, you know, Aaron Miller for our, our area, he's awesome. Oregon believer. I've met with him once already. I want to try to meet with him again. And, and these guys, man, they listen. Our guys are listening to us. You know, that's our end to Lansing. And, and this election coming up, man, it's huge, guys. It's huge. And we need, to, we need to not just worry about one part of that. If you don't feel like you can vote for a president, then don't vote for a president. But you need to pay attention to congressmen, and, and you need to pay attention to the bills and the laws that are all being passed, and we should all still be in that voting booth. There's a lot of yes and no stuff that's going to go on, too. It happens every time, right? So with that in mind, we need to be praying for the church in Georgia, for sure. California, New York. They're all passing laws to do this stuff, to force this, to allow it to happen in spite of, and you don't see the reports of all the, all the garbage that's going on, all these guys that are getting arrested because they're sex offenders who put on a dress and went in a women's bathroom. Already happening. Already happening. Yeah. They're already catching them. Yeah, probably because they were already doing it. Now it's just legal. So pray for the church. Pray for your leader, please. Pray for me. Please pray for me. So verse 3, remembering without ceasing, Paul says, we remember you without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our, of our God and Father. And you see three words there that are familiar because they're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, faith, hope, and love. Paul hadn't written that to the Corinthian church yet. He wrote it to Thessalonica first. But look what they produce. This is why Paul would say to them, 
in, in the love chapter, this is, this is what happens. This is why these three are so important. Faith produces work. James tell us, tells us that, that faith without deeds is dead. And, and Paul even writes in Romans, when people try to use the book of Romans to, to go against the book of James, Paul writes in Romans that we're created to do his work and his workmanship. We are his workmanship created to do, to do good works in Christ. That's right after we're saved by, by grace through faith. But we are created to do works. It is the, the outworking of our faith in what we believe. In the labor of love, to labor, that to work to the point of exhaustion. And I'm not the only one who gets phone calls in the middle of the night. I'm not the only one who goes to the hospital for visits. That happens, that's, that's everyone. And Paul's talking in general. He's like, you know, pray for your pastor because he, he's going house to house and he's meeting with all of you people and he's just dead tired. No, he's saying, listen, we're thankful that your whole church is laboring to this extent that you're putting, you are sold out to this. You are in this. Yes, I can't tell you how thankful I am sometimes when, when we have things that we want to get ready for, we want to do. Because people show up. I, I get more out of this little church than some of my friends who have bigger churches for volunteers to, to set up, to tear down. And, and it's like it's a party, right? It's a party. What, do, what did I just say about Thursday? If you guys show up to, to, to help set up for Passover... And the band wants to practice, the band can practice, and we'll have live band while we're setting up for, nobody else does that. It's not even planned. We just got two things coming together in the same night in the same place. Let's make them work. Right? Hey, we'll probably order some pizza because, you know, we're going to get this done and get it all together because everybody's got to go to work on Friday before they come to Passover Friday night. And, and some of us are going to go then turn around on Saturday and, you know, We'll, we'll need cleanup on Saturday because I don't want to stay here all night on Friday night. <laughs> but, you know, we, we got people who aren't even part of this church already. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll help you clean up on Saturday. Or we'll help you clean up afterwards on Friday a little bit. <laughs> and they always do. They always do. People from other churches, man, everybody just starts. We break down faster than we, than we put up. It's great. And it's fun. But, but it is a labor. Sometimes I know you guys get, I'm feeling it. Sunday afternoon, man. Sunday afternoon. Ah, some Sunday afternoons when we have Sunday night service, I'm going, what was I thinking when I started the Sunday nights back up? I'm going to go, go to sleep. I tried to take a nap. And I'm like, oh, set the alarm for a half an hour because I could go back. But that's all right. And I'm not the only one who feels it. I know that. It's a labor. Labor of love. But that's what love does, man. It drives you to just do things for people. It's a driving us what when you're so tired. And then you find out there's one more thing to do. And you just say, and you go. Right? Labor of love. And a hope, a hope that produces patience, a hope of the return of Jesus. Our hope in Jesus produces patience. We're waiting, right? We're waiting for him to come back, waiting for him to come back. We don't lose hope because if we lose hope, then we end up being like the others and going, well, you know what? He said 2,000 years ago he's coming back and you know, he's a little late by my clock. This isn't his, our clock. This is his clock. And we have to remind ourselves to him, man, a thousand years, you know, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Time is nothing to him. He made it. He wound the clock and set it and let it go. He made it. He's outside of time. And our hope, our hope because we look at everybody else around us, produces patience because we look at everybody else and if we're honest, we see ourselves in everybody else. Right? Everybody else out there is the same as we were or we could be that fast. It should produce patience in us. We should be patient with them because when you look in the mirror, you see the person that God is really patient with. Right? I know. I know how patient he's got to be with me. Why? You know? If, if it was me, I'm going, why Why have you not learned this yet? I, I'm, I, I can be like that as a dad, but my Heavenly Father is never like that. He's patient with me. Paul said, we've heard of this. We've heard of your faith, your, your love, your hope in Jesus Christ in the sight of, our Father, of God our Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. You're, you are loved by God. By God Almighty, the creator of the universe, the man, the man. The one who created everything. Everything and everything that makes up everything and made it all work together. You are loved individually by Him. He is not just in control of all the prophetic events that are happening in the Middle East. And He's not just in control of countries and nations and the bills. And he loves you alone in your room. He pays attention to you too. It's not just making sure the stars and the planets don't crash into each other. and It's not just that. I, I look at me and I'm thinking, that's probably easier than dealing with me. You just set it in motion. It's going perfect. 
Sin happens. There's a little wobble here and there. But it's not like you didn't know it was going to happen. Your election, that God called you out, that he chose you. Paul knows. Paul said, I, I know, I know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he called you. I was only there for three weeks, but I know, I know he called you. The, the evidence of that is everything that was in verse 3. The, the faith, the, you know, the, faith uh, the work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope. It's all evidence of the election. Just for our gospel, did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Paul says, see, you, you followed our example. We were only there for a short time, but man, it came, the, the word came to you, the gospel, not, not in word only. You didn't just hear it. You didn't just take in some verses and, and pray a prayer and everything's okay. They, they grabbed a hold of the word of God spoken by these men and lived out by these men in front of them. That was a short time to be an example. It was a short time. This is a young, young church. We would be telling them, sit down for a little while. You grow in the Lord first. Learn a few things. Paul's saying here, man, it wasn't just in that, but it was in power. You didn't just take the word and just memorize a few verses and earn a candy bar. You got, you got the power. You took it in power and in the Holy Spirit. You begin to... He filled you like he filled me, Paul is saying. And it began to work out in you immediately. You understood the word. You, you, you know that when you ask your father things, that, that he's listening. They saw powerful things happening in their life already. And they're filled with the spirit. That's why they're seeing all this stuff. It's kind of like we're going almost backwards. But, but they're filled with the spirit. And in much assurance... They're confident of their faith. They're so confident of their faith. They're so confident of the God that they believe in that they are acting out. They're walking in love. They're walking in faith. They're walking with hope. In the face of persecution, the sword, the cross, they can face it all. The beating with rods. Paul and Silas beaten with rods before they were put in the prison. And listen, we know that the, the Romans didn't have when they beat somebody, if these guys were beaten by Romans, they didn't have the law that told them 40 lashes and, and minus one to make sure that we don't go over the 40. They didn't have that. They had beat you into submission in mind is what they had. Does that teach you a lesson? You know, in fact, in the, in the Jewish culture, I, from what I understand, it was, it was let up with each stroke. It was less and less so that it, it didn't overwhelm you and kill you. Not in the Roman culture. Many men didn't survive the beatings in the Roman culture. They faced all of that. But you still have the assurance. You're still walking confident in God that he can take care of these things for you. And, and following the example of, of Paul and Timothy and Silas and those that were with him. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much effect, affliction with joy in the Holy Spirit. Much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. You often put those two words together in your own life. Affliction and joy. When you're afflicted, when you feel like you're really going through it, you stick joy with that or you start having words like frustrated and, and tired and worn out. And, or is it joy? They're following the apostles. Also, we saw in, in Acts when the apostles were, were, were arrested and they were beaten and they were told, go out, don't, don't speak in his name anymore. And they went out full of joy because they've been found worthy to suffer for Christ. Full of joy for it. I probably haven't sounded very joyful talking about the laws that are being made, have I? There's a part of us that, that should be, to be honest with you. That they think so much of us that they would make laws against us. Are you, you look at it like that? They think so much of Jesus and so much of the church. They think about us so often that they're making laws to try to c control us. Not because we're some great big threat physically, like we're going to blow things up or we're going it, to... It, it's not because of that. Why? Because we love people. Because we want to point them in the right direction. We want them to change their lives. We want them to walk with Jesus. We want them to be in heaven with him for all of eternity. That's why they're making laws against us. Because there's still enough evidence of the real church in the United States that they have to make laws to try to snuff it out. Regardless of what they see around the rest of the world. China is tearing down steeples and churches right now. <laughs> Huge numbers. And it's one of the fastest growing churches in, America, in the world. They're booming. 
The more they do in China, the, the bigger the church gets. The more they do in Iraq, the bigger the church gets. The more they do in Iran, the bigger the church gets. The more they paint the sign of the Nazarene on their door, the more of them. Some, some of them are going home to Syria. I just heard that it was, it was last month or last week, a hundred, some town in Syria, they had a hundred Christians come back. And they were expecting, I think, 200 more in the next weeks to come back to their hometown in Syria. All we hear about are the Muslims that want to get out. Maybe we should take them all in so the Christians can move into Syria and take it. And anybody who wants to stay behind, they can just convert the whole country. I mean, they're the only ones going home. They're going back to that. And those little girls, they didn't look scared. They didn't look nothing. I don't want to be afraid. I want to be filled with the Spirit, and I want to be have the assurance of my faith. I want to have a. I want to work and labor in love. I want to work with in. I want this, and I want this for all of us. Because if we do this, it won't matter what the world does and says. If we walk this way, God will move through us and through this community and through this state, and it'll it'll get contagious. So much so that this young church, only a couple months old, became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. They were the inspiration for the rest of the church in the area. This little church that had only been together for a little while was the inspiration for everybody else. For from you the word of the Lord sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but also in every place. In every place. Listen, I already told you. Garvel told me. Our, our little group, our little... I'm getting you guys... Seriously, our church is going along with some of the things we've been looking at in the, in the instruction and the encouragement that Paul's been given. When, when Garvel tells me, you guys have no idea how far your ministry is reaching around here. Well, it's because some of you work in Indiana, some of you work in Kalamazoo. We come in contact with people all over the place. And, and people who are going around in other ministries are hearing about us, little, little us. In every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. This church in Thessalonica is getting places before Paul. Their reputation has preceded Paul. So that Paul says, well, I don't even have to say anything anymore. They're laying the groundwork. God has used this persecuted group of little young church on fire. They're on fire. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols and serve the living and true God. And that, that word, the, the words there, the construction there, is it was a continual turning. It wasn't a one-time, oh, you know, it, it was a continual. They stayed in the fight. They stayed away from all the idols. It is said of the Roman culture that it was easier to find a God than it was to find a man that you were looking for because there were so many gods. But they found the true and living God. There were many people turning to Judaism in that time because it was a one God. It was monotheistic. You found the one God, man. You turned to God from idols and served the living and true God. You turned from those chunks of stone and wood and some gold and silver and some trinkets and some ridiculous rituals and all the things that fed their natural tendencies. Think about that. Everything that satisfied them physically and emotionally that was wrapped up in the worship of those false gods, they turned away from all of that and turned to the true and the living God and wait for his son from heaven. And there it is, the first mention, and it's right here in chapter 1. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. He's coming back to keep us from the wrath. And they were waiting already. They're already waiting for Jesus. And, but they weren't just sitting back. This isn't a, you know, sit back, wait for Jesus to come. If I hide up, hole up in my little hole here and I store enough food and I don't have to see the rest of the world and I put a fence up around my property and I have enough guns and ammo and enough things to keep me and my family safe for a few years and we put a hole in the ground and we'll hide in there if we have to. And they didn't do that. They weren't waiting out their time. They were after it. They seized the mission. We are not commissioned we are not instructed to come in we're instructed to go out to move out i've gone a little long but you guys listen we need to really be encouraged and i mean be praying hard for these other churches because and i i have not been able to be with my other calvary chapel pastor brothers in a long time 
Every time they have a get together, every time they just had one yesterday, every time, it never works out for me to go, I have to work. And every time when I ask Pastor Roger, how's everybody doing? And most of them are so discouraged, they're so tired. And I wanted to go today so I could encourage them and, and because, you know, hard times are hard times, but we can, I'm teaching this stuff so it's real to me and I don't know where they're at where they're teaching right now that they're not seeing this in the Bible maybe they're maybe they're in different parts I don't know but pray for those guys and it's not just Calvary Chapel it's other pastors who want to preach the word want to get it out there they don't know what to do they don't know where to go they don't know they don't know if people are listening they don't know and they're discouraged they don't see whatever whatever they're asking for or whatever they're not seeing it the way they think they ought to be seen I don't know why they're discouraged Maybe they're just tired. Maybe it is that labor of love has worn them out. Pray that these guys will have a fresh, new feeling of the Holy Spirit. Because listen, I was there a year, year and a half ago. And even with the pressure being lifted off a year ago, it was still four or five months of like, I don't, I don't know if I can do. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and I'm sorry, but I'm just, I'm, I'm awake and alive and I want everybody else to be. In hard times, some of you are going to go through what we went through, not the same situation, not the same circumstance, but you're going to be hard, hard pressed. And you need to let us, because the only way that my family survived this that we went through in the last three years was because we came to you guys and we didn't hide anything from anybody. And we let people know what was going on in our lives so that they could pray for us and they could support us. And you got to do that. You hole up in your heart, you're going to hole up in your house. We're waiting for Jesus, the one who's going to deliver us from the wrath, the wrath of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. I know I think I say this every week. I don't think I can say it enough, Father. Thank you for these people who are before us to set the example. Lord, even though we can't see it with our eyes, we have your word in front of us, and we can still hang on to it. And Lord, we can see it in our brothers and sisters around the world. Lord, those two little girls with such an assurance of you that would answer without hesitation with your words and your heart. Father, pour out your spirit on us. Let us be like those girls. In Jesus' name, amen.